which is yours. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about a new work uh, called Jason Bud Proofs. Uh, so what it is, it's um, uh, we're working on defining a new container format uh, similar to the Jose containers. So JWSs and JWEs, the underlying signing and encryption. Uh, but we're working to try to do newer um, algorithms, cryptographic primitives, and techniques. Uh, so this is a bit more in the vein of some of the verifiable credentials efforts, the idea of um, having things like ID token behave a little bit more like access tokens where uh, a client gets those and then chooses when to share them with different parties. Um, there's been some, uh, uh, in the crypt uh, cryptography sphere, there's been a lot of uh, discussions about this, uh, these types of con concepts for several decades in the realms of concepts like anonymous credentials. So how can we um, limit the amount of privacy impacting data that's transferred as much as possible. And this is uh, an attempt to do that by taking these credentials and allowing the new role of the prover, which for uh, OAuth would be the client, uh, to have the ability to take uh, these cryptographically protected messages and derive new messages uh, with different properties. And then those messages, um, because those uh, types of derivations are allowed, uh, are also still capable of being cryptographically verified as being from the original issuer. So examples of uh, some of the capabilities uh, that may be supported, uh, one would be selective disclosure of information. So uh, it's easier to imagine in the scope of uh, a document with uh, tons of claims about a person, possibly like a full medical record or a college transcript that um, I may only want to disclose pieces of that information. And I may not want that to be an interactive protocol where I have to go and fetch a new copy. So uh, this would allow me to take a document, even if I was, you know, potentially it was a transcript issued by a university that is no longer around, if I have that document, I could still um, share that information and I would be able to selectively disclose what sort of information I was sharing rather than sharing my entire college history every time. Um, likewise, when you have selective disclosure, uh, you could, uh, especially if you're disclosing, say, that you're over a certain age, uh, the ability to present this multiple times and not have factors of the underlying cryptography serve as correlation. So um, people who know ECDSA, uh, some of the other ones, there's uh, initialization vectors, there's nonces, random inputs that actually mean that uh, signature is gonna be pretty steady and it basically serves as its own identifier for the message. So can I get a message and present it multiple times even to the same party potentially and not have them know who I am? Um, third one is the ability to answer predicates about that information when the, the, the uh, source document uh, JWP allows it. So instead of disclosing my age, can I say I'm within a particular age range as an example, or instead of giving my address, um, basically can I box it in into a, basically a, a geolocation, geofence and say, well, I'm in the United States or I'm in uh, like, this particular state uh, or the city uh, mathematically. And then finally, um, a lot of these systems, because they're deriving these messages, they integrate their own kinds of subject confirmation, proof of possession uh, systems. Uh, in fact, in some cases that's integrated into um, the challenge response itself of the underlying protocol. So how this would relate more to um, uh, at the OAuth level would be um, the idea of having a access token and, and being able to reduce the scopes uh, without having to get new access tokens issued. So being able to do that on a request by request basis. Typically the cryptography is more expensive for these other ones. Um, 
but the ability to say that uh, an authorization policy is being met by the token without actually exposing the underlying uh, data for that particular user, that particular client that's used to satisfy that policy is something that you can do with things like zero knowledge proofs. Um, if you have a dynamic relationship between ASs and uh, resource servers, uh, the ability to potentially eliminate uh, the correlation factors and the usage of those APIs uh, is something that we haven't seen a lot of, but could come up in certain use cases. Um, and that would still give you the ability to resolve those identity, uh, you know, the, the client and the user uh, on abuse with the AS or with the third party audit service. And uh, those proof of possessions give us a couple new way to uh, a couple new ways to do sender vouchers. Um, so uh, right now, this is being incubated within the Decentralized Identity Foundation as part of the Advanced Crypto Working Group, which is relatively new. Um, uh, this itself is relatively new too. Uh, we're inspired heavily by Jose. Uh, we have a lot of the, the core dependencies shared, a lot of inspiration there. Uh, the aim is to be moving this to ITF following incubation. So once we feel it's you know, reasonably stable, we have uh, some reference implementations, a couple of people have agreed on the, the shape that we want it to move it into the ITF process. Uh, and we're also looking uh, at the same time to uh, build the complementary CBOR container. In a lot of cases, uh, they'll just fall out of not having things encoded. Uh, so this is a quick picture of how things are structured. So uh, underneath you have the algorithms, uh, the key format and the um, uh, token uh, of the existing uh, Jose kind of line of specs, but you have uh, JSON web proofs that are describing the format of the actual tokens, that, that container format, which I'll get to in the next slide. Um, on top of that, we have algorithms, but this looks a little different than uh, JSON web algorithms because JSON web, web algorithms was really defining how to use algorithms that already had been established. And in this case, um, we actually expect a lot of these algorithms are going to define how they fit into this uh, kind of uh, uh, framework and which features are actually able to provide. So, uh, for example, uh, we may have, or we're expecting to have uh, token formats that are based on uh, NIST algorithms, uh, you know, typical P256 type uh, curve without any special crypto, just something you implement out of the box. But that might only allow for, say, selective disclosure and might not have some of the uh, uh, predicates for doing policy evaluation or some of the uh, non correlation. and. As, as a result for privacy reasons, those you might want to have be single use with the representing identity. Um, whereas something based on a pairing curve or a zero knowledge mechanisms probably would have all the capabilities. Uh, separately from this, uh, defining the equivalent of JWT as a, a proof token that has uh, the extra capabilities to be able to support select disclosure of that kind of structured data. And I'll get to that a little bit later too. Um, so this would be a typical JWS message. You have your protected header, you have a payload, you have a signature. Hopefully everyone here uh, is uh, a little bit familiar with that. And by default, JSON web proof, just adds a little bit more there. So we have these payloads. If you look towards the right, um, that payload section, the different payloads are being delimited by the tilde character because we had one left uh, that was URL safe. Uh, but the same sort of thing, a, a protected header describing the characteristics of the message, uh, payloads, and a proof at the end. And um, in this particular case, we omitted two payloads. We uh, This method allowed us to just basically strip them out and only disclose the first of those three payloads from the previous slide. So uh, JSON proof token that builds on top of that is, uh, you know, 
trying to do um, kind of some of the characteristics of a jot, some of the uh, benefits we've had from a jot with this selectively disclosed kind of world. And um, very much trying to set the stage for uh, being able to protect uh, against correlation. So the core tenet of this is that there's a fixed number of slots and that those slots have meaning. So say the first one would be their name, second one would be um, their address, third one might be their date of birth, and that there's a layout that actually describes how those should be interpreted. Uh, and like JWT, it's building on top of the core. So in this case, on top of JWP. But if someone has other use cases, if they have data where they actually do need something more dynamic, like variable slots, uh, they'd be capable of doing that. The reason we um, really try to fix some of this information down is so that if I am trying to prevent correlation, if I'm trying to prevent uh, being able to you know, derive additional information that wasn't intended, uh, if say I had of these payloads, I had um, a, one for each possible, um, for each uh, group or role that a user was in, for instance, uh, then I would be able to look, even if they weren't being disclosed, whether there were you know 10 or 100. Um, so I could start to build patterns like recognizing that this person might be an administrator, for instance, based on the amount of data that wasn't disclosed to me. So instead, the idea would be if, if say they're an administrator, that value would go into a particular slot so it could be disclosed. Otherwise, no value would be there. The user doesn't have a choice to disclose it or not. So uh, getting to an example here, um, uh, with a JWT on the left, this should also look familiar. The, the baseline template uh, document would have three payloads. They would be basically the JSON text values of the, the uh, payloads on the left. But in the uh, JWKS um, or something at that level, we're still discussing where to locate it. There'd be a layout that basically serves as a template of saying, this is how to interpret payloads if they're disclosed. So here we're trying to shoot for um, uh, a JSON safe and relatively simple format that can be used to take some set or subset of those disclosed payloads and use them to generate something that a, uh, a client or some other piece of software that understands JWTs uh, would be comfortable with. If I emit a payload, in this case, the, the person's name, um, that would mean that the interpreted JSON document just would not have that uh, name property on the left. So when I generate a JSON by taking the combination of the layout and the payload, I would just eliminate the name. Um, do um, you, uh, yes. Don't, uh, this is a simple question. Um, is the uh, is the structure limited to um, three payloads exactly, or is this an extensible array? Uh, so right now, or is that the, not known? So right now, the idea is that the issuer, when they're defining what they're going to issue, would actually know what was available. So, for instance, the example on the left, where I have uh, an address, if I want to say have a, a work address and a home address, potentially, they would mm -hmm. do like two comma three or, or something to that effect. And if someone only had one address, then the actual issued uh, JWP would just emit that second value. They just okay. wouldn't have anything to disclose. So, so uh, the issuer, I'm sorry, just from a data structure perspective, the issuer defines uh, an array of fixed length functionally is what we're seeing here? Right. So when they're okay. when they're saying what they're willing, what they're actually going to issue, right. uh, they're basically matlibbing it up uh, for people who had matlibs as a kid, where yep. they say, you know, this is the data I have. I'm I don't have more than ten roles. I'm ever going to disclose. I don't have more than a certain number of scopes. I'm just going to say this has twelve elements and build a message from it, 
And some people will decide not to share that information. Sometimes I just won't have that information at all. Right. Uh, but the, there but are, the length and labeling is up to the issuer, fundamentally. Fundamentally. And, 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 okay. Th thank you. I, I don't mean to derail that. I was I was just getting stuck on the uh, on the data structure more than anything. Thank you. And Justin, oh. just to add, um, the it's important for the issuer to come up with a fixed, you know, whatever total capacity it's going to need for anything it issues, and keep it at that length at all times. Um, otherwise, if they're issuing variable length arrays, uh, those become a factor for for correlation. So they, they can make them linkable. Like if I get a credential that has eight items, somebody else gets one that has 12, that might be the administrator, right? Because they have more. So it, that's why the issuer tends to, the, the idea is they lock it in for everything they're going to be issuing in a given, you know, with a given key, essentially. I mean, that seems to just kick the problem down the road to figuring out that, oh, you have four different fields that are never filled in and this other person has four fields that are filled in um, and doing the correlation based on that. Uh, I have not been in the conversations that you guys have. So I again, I don't mean to uh, derail this, but uh, that that is a very interesting um, aspect of it. Yes, and you can always yeah. choose to selectively disclose to make yourself linkable. Right. But the thought is that the protocol doesn't force it. Yeah, so I can I can add a little bit of more color there as well. So this is being primarily built for the verifiable credential style of use cases, where you know maybe I get something representing uh, myself as a citizen or myself as an employee, and it could be a much richer set of uh, data, with the idea that um, I'm only ever going to disclose the things that a particular party needs. So if um, you know, if, you know, my, my hunting license was in there, um, but other people didn't have it, you tend to not want to disclose that some people could have one and one couldn't, um, or that these are different types of people, because the richer the data model, if you have variable length, the more likely that you're, um, you know, you're correlating by not really correlating, but you're segmenting the population. You're giving a couple bits of tracking information. And um, the idea as well is uh, maybe not for uh, traditional uh, crypto mechanisms, like just a, you know, multiple signatures over each payload, but for um, so that zero knowledge repairing based systems. Um, it could be that I'm not going and fetching a message every time that I fetch it like once a year, like I like I would go actually get a driver's license or once every a couple of years, like I would go and get a passport. Uh, so the, uh, the idea is that there could be a lot of data that is possible, but that a person may or may not have. When I actually present that um, information, uh, the party that's receiving it doesn't have as a correlation factor that some people could have given this to me and chose not to, while other people just didn't have it. It looks the same to the, the person receiving the value once it's been derived as I never had one. Right, so this is, uh, to just add to that, this is something that in the healthcare space, we talk about the difference between uh, responding with a 403 versus a 404 on a uh, sensitive medical record. And, um, you know, it's knowing that it's that it could be there, uh, and I'm just not letting you see it is actually giving you information. So there's there, there's a, a lot of good precedent to uh, this line of thinking. Yep, and um, that that's pretty common for API design of of trying not to, you know, disclose why something didn't work or why some piece of information the user chose not to to give it out. And for healthcare, you definitely want, don't want to distinguish the people who chose, like, for instance, not to give you their blood sugar readings versus they don't have any. I wish I could agree with you that it were common, DW. But I, I, I think I've derailed your presentation enough. My apologies. Uh, well, we'll have a lot of time for questions at the end. And then if we um, wind up finishing uh, before the allowed time, then uh, I hope everyone had a, a great conference.
So uh, going forward, uh, this is just showing that you could have structured information. So the, the message on the left is pretty flat because it's actually representing more of a traditional JWT uh, versus say a um, uh, JSON LDE formatted piece of data. Uh, but I wanted to make sure people understood that I could release information in a single payload. So the issuer can decide like, um, I'm planning to have the locality, you know, state and country all disclosed in one go as an atomic thing because they're the issuer is the one who defines what the payloads are. Uh, we've also had discussions for the second item, the, the name of uh, John Doe, uh, whether or not we wanted to have an example of first name and last name, knowing that for the compatibility with the um, JDT claim names, that might actually be that payload filling in multiple parts of the template. So the family name and given name. So this is all still very much in flux. This is basically the spec to put all of the bike shedding in one spot. Uh, and we don't know if we're gonna make it. Like I, I wouldn't wanna see more than two, but the, you know, things like uh, fixed payloads uh, could have a, a severe impact for some of the types of records people want to do. And it may be uh, worth having a spec that's able to interpret those or the payloads themselves, people may decide they have a format that they want that isn't JSON text, that they, you know, the message that they're forming isn't JSON on the left. And both of those would be alternatives, just like having a non-JSON payload that's signed wouldn't be JWT, but you could easily make a spec that defines what it looks like and how to interoperate with it for some value of easy in, in spec creation. Uh, so just to give people an idea, this is kind of a, a, a starter scheme, uh, more for describing how uh, selective disclosure could work. So in this case, that proof winds up being a concatenation of the signature of the, the um, header and then a signature of each payload, and then those actual payload signatures are included. Uh, so if I emit a value, then that's fine. Um, I can still verify the rest of the, the payloads. If I include a payload, you can check that the signature actually correlates and it hasn't been modified. Uh, there's, this is definitely a bike shedding of crypto. So you could have uh, Merkle-based schemes where you're doing, you wind up having to do salting so that people can't look at like a hash of the value true or false and figure out which one it is. Um, but this this scheme allows us to pretty easily use like a off the shelf, uh, like P256 signing algorithm and build and verify these messages. Uh, some of the other uh, systems, not so much. Um, and it has limited functionality. So some of those things like trying to evaluate policy or do predicates like, is this person between the age of 20 and 35? Um, you have limited abilities to do that. There's something called a hash chain that you could potentially use here. But, um, but some of the really advanced techniques that melt my brain uh, just aren't gonna be possible. Uh, flip side is this should also be pretty darn fast. Uh, so that's all I have. So I will stop sharing my screen and people can ask me questions. Uh, Fleet. Hey, David, um, just a quick question. Where can I follow this work? Uh, so right now it's being incubated within the Centralized Identity Foundation. Um, it will eventually go into the IETF, which has, um, they have different IPR policies. So we're leaning more towards IETF IPR, which is kind of Wild World West. So we have a um, GitHub repo. I will link that if someone else hasn't already, someone already has. Uh, where we're doing that, uh, and that the README has links to the draft versions of those specs. Okay, thank you. Justin. 
Hey, uh, so my question is that this is um, since the uh, definitions of what fields are available in their locations and everything are closely tied to the key. And I think it's strongly implied. Again, I have not read the, the spec and I apologize, uh, but uh, it's closely tied to the key <laughs> itself. Uh, what is the expectation of ensuring key integrity um, since you are now putting a strong reliance on fields in the JWK that are not the crypto parameters that are verifiable using the same signature bits, which is to say that field number two really is my name. Um, how are you protecting that association at the JWK level? Uh, so I think the question you're asking is exactly where we are in discussions right now. Uh, okay. So we don't have an answer for that, but we know that question, it's much better formed now, um, even in the last few weeks. So we're, we, we do need to come up with an answer of how do you make sure that um, the definition itself is integrity protected and linked to the credential. And it, it does need to be stronger than just, you know, a, a key ID. Right, so exactly. Yeah, we, because the, because again, the uh, if it's not bound to the cryptographic material, you need some other mechanism. Really glad to know that you guys are looking into that. Uh, I, I see that as a key, no pun intended, <laughs> a key trust anchor uh, for, uh, for that piece. Yep. Awesome, thank you. Bye. Jones. Hello. Um, so to further answer Philippe's question, if you actually want to participate in the work directly, there is a call every other week, uh, which is a subgroup call in the DIFF crypto working group, but it's specific to this uh, Jason Webb proofs work. And if you're interested in joining that, um, a number of us on the call here could send you that scheduling link. And, I, you know, I do have to say that I, I wore this shirt for the uh, occasion. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. I almost right. wore mine for this conference too, Mike. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad to see it's represented. <laughs> Very good. And to add a little bit of, um, color and confirmation to what Mike said in response to what Philippe asked. The, um, uh, this is in DIF, uh, that does have uh, some participation impacts. Uh, we're pushing as much as possible into that GitHub that was linked uh, in the discussion. Uh, yeah, file issues there. For, for that reason, our calls are uh, primarily uh, to triage those issues and make sure they're moving forward. So they're just bi-weekly calls or every other week, I should say. And the um, uh, we do have some discussion on Slack, but if there are people who wanna participate uh, outside, then we will quickly try to shuttle those discussions over onto GitHub as well. Uh, Cause the goal is, to, the goal on, uh, once it goes to ITF, it's gonna be full open participation anyway, so. Uh, we're just trying to accelerate uh, being able to get to that point and, and hopefully uh, prevent a little bit of a little bit of bike shitting uh, once we get over there. Anyone else have a question or a comment? Um, Jeremy, sorry to hear you're not feeling great. If you feel up to it, maybe you can talk about some of the initial families of algorithms that we intend to describe in the algorithm spec. And I will say that DW already answered part of that by saying we could use missed algorithms in some ways. Yep. Um, I, if I have to mute suddenly, it's just from coughing. I apologize. Um, it definitely single use, right? So the, the ability to use selective disclosure with a single use credential, uh, it doesn't, it, the only way that you can achieve unlinkability is by going back to the issuer and getting another token to use. Uh, but you stu do still get to apply 
selective disclosure, which as Dita mentioned, can be very useful in, in, in minimal disclosure um, situations where you, you might you know, want to minimally scope a token. Um, so, and that's, it's a very simple signature across an array of signatures uh, style approach. So that'll be one family. Another one is obviously for those familiar with LD proofs uh, and the um, creation and momentum behind BDS plus uh, that is also part of the diff uh, crypto working group uh, to stabilize that signature format. Um, and that will be one of the families of algorithms as well. Um, and that uses pairing based curves. There's another one that's sort of an analog to BBS plus, but using slightly different techniques called, I can't pronounce it, but PS uh, signatures point something um, that will likely also, you know, it has a lot of sort of academic momentum. And then another one that we're very excited about is Spartan. And that is essentially traditional um, NIST curves, but added the ability to do predicate proofs uh, and generate proofs from those signatures. So the issuer would use a traditional signing mechanism, and then the holder would be able to use zero knowledge proofs using the Spartan framework uh, to apply this selective disclosure and unlinkability. So I think we'll, you know, we'll see three to four initial families of algorithms um, get developed here over the next few months. Thank you, that, that's useful. I'll personally add this bit of color. Um, stepping back, part of what I'm enjoying about this is I'm learning new things, just like I did when I worked with my friends on Jose. Um, one of the things I've learned is that you'll both have claims that are claims like we think of in jots where there's just a value, but there's going to be predicate proofs as well that are expressible using some of these algorithms. Uh, you know, the classic proofs that uh, you have possession of something or that your age is greater than something. Um, and, you know, those of you who know the literature in this know more than this about me, more about this than me. But so one of the tricky engineering things as we're designing this format is enabling use of the algorithm specific properties where applicable. So for instance, when a claim is actually represented as a point on a curve with a particular set of meaning rather than as the claim value, and yet doing so in a way that everything doesn't devolve to being algorithm specific. And that's where I'm really thrilled that we have real cryptographers um, from Microsoft Research, among others, working on this with us so that maybe we thread the needle correctly. Um, it is exciting to be learning these things, but I worry of one thing, and that is all this, let's say new crypto or you know emerging crypto that simply isn't available in standard scripting languages that are commonly used on, based on OpenSSL. Yep. Now OpenSSL has been stuck doing, uh, what is it, um, quick uh, for three years now, and they're not moving forward. And they're pushing off doing new crypto after they release OpenSSL 3 with all of these things included. Um, so I wonder, you know, when is this going to be relevant to the regular developer? Well, this if, is if I can't of... use native crypto, I'm, I'm going to fail because I'm going to be re-implementing the actual crypto bits and I don't want to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just as we, when we did Jose, we chose the algorithms that were in the set that we published in JWA, partly by looking at what were the nearly universally available algorithms of the day. What I'm really thrilled about 
and again, this was something I learned, I didn't know this, was that some of these uh, methods can use standard cryptographic operations, signing with uh, ES-256, with the P-256 curve. And just by combining multiple signatures um, in particular ways and disclosing or not disclosing the values signed in ways that used ubiquitously supported algorithms, you can do full-blown selective disclosure without any uh, innovative crypto at all. Now, the caveat is they are then single-use tokens, I believe. Uh, maybe someone who knows more can tell me that there's ways to do it that's not single-use as well, but you can certainly get single-use with the stuff in OpenSSL today. Yeah, I can also, uh, I can color that a little bit. So the traditional uh, ECDSA, um, you wind up having correlation for that, for your use case, you know, again, this is broader than just verifiable credentials or access tokens. Uh, for use case, that might be acceptable. And you have, you know, you have the um, JWA, you have, you know, clear algorithms that have been adopted more for particular use cases but you don't really have any clear winners and losers. Like when JWA came out, RSA was a heck of a lot easier to find a library to do than the elliptic curve stuff was. It was, it was getting pushed, but it wasn't all the way there. Um, and then you still had a decision between the two of compatibility versus size and, size and speed. Uh, with this case, there'll probably be choices between uh, you know, performance, uh, underlying features, so single use versus multi-use predicate proofs. Um, you know, some of these techniques, depending on how much you uh, layer on, it's a little bit of a, a uh, you know, grab as you go from an issuer standpoint and turning on some features may mean that issuing these tokens is harder or the uh, verification is harder or the, the derivation is harder. And you decide, okay, well, I can't really justify that feature. And these are all problems we have today. And they're all problems that the issuer who's actually defining the token and what you're able to drive, uh, that's already the party that's had to make those decisions on what is and isn't capable and, and what cryptography has chosen. To the point of uh, language availability, uh, we've been uh, mostly sticking for the things that aren't NIST curves. Uh, we've been sticking to implementations that are available at Rust. And one of the reasons this is useful is Rust, you can compile to C. There's a lot of efforts to have uh, even richer language bindings, uh, but you also can compile to WebAssembly. So uh, we do have some uh, prototype code uh, building messages using different algorithms just um, at this point to make sure we're not painting ourselves in the corner in terms of the starting container format and, and things like that. But we're using Rust and we're compiling it to WebAssembly. And then the actual implementation is in uh, JavaScript on Node running that WebAssembly. Uh, but you could take a Rust library and compile it into an iOS app, um, uh, into an Android Java app. Um, I'm not sure if you have to use uh, the interface is there for native calls raw or for us to actually provide something for you. Uh, but that's there's a rich ecosystem there that hopefully will bootstrap people if we wind up having reference implementations. Uh, but it's definitely something that you will have to consider. If I do single use tokens, I get to select disclosure. It's a little more expensive because there's more signatures. They're a little bit larger because we're not dividing things up into payloads. I have to find some things beforehand, like the actual layout of the messages I want to issue. But on the flip side, I get all these extra capabilities. So this is something I'm interested in adopting. Uh, but even in the verifiable credential community, there's plenty of VCs deployed today that don't have any of these special features. They're just signed messages. And uh, they include basically the key or a did that tells you how to resolve the key for the use of then, you know, do uh, proof of possession. And that's it. No selective disclosure. Everyone I share that message with knows it's the same message. And that's fine for those use cases, or it's 
good enough to get started until uh, all the crypto and all the implementations catch up. One thing I will say about the plan to take it to the ITF is we will get the benefit of the rigor that comes with the IETF security apparatus, including access to the CFRG, the Cryptographic Forum Research Group, which vets uses of cryptography by IETF specs. I mean, one of the more prominent things they did in the last few years was vet and promulgate the ED25519 and the 384 variant of it uh, for use in TLS 1.3, but also for use in other cryptographic operations. And that was a result of a pretty thorough discussion, which I enjoyed being at least a fly on the wall for. Mm, that's a lengthy process. Huge, it is. huge. And it, and it matters. I'm, yeah. It's been two, two and a half years that I'm waiting for X Chacha to go through, and it's not there yet. For which? Um, the derived Chacha, so X Chacha. Oh, oh, oh okay. The Chacha, okay. In what context are you wanting to use the Chacha? Just well, cha cha in general is fine already, but X cha cha is again something used in Paseto, uh, uh, swear word around these parts when wearing Jose shirts. Um, but as well, um, there is an ID for X cha cha based Jose algorithms. Cool. Can you put a link to that in the chat if it's easy? Yeah. Thank you. DW, anything else? Jeremy? No, I think, uh, you know, we welcome people to come uh, read those. If you have questions, raise them as issues. Uh, we'll answer them. We'll decide whether they should be answered in a more formal fashion so that other people don't have the same questions lingering. Uh, if you want to participate, uh, feel free to go to GitHub if uh, uh, and let us also make sure you let us know and uh, we'll try to be inviting for that. And uh, we really look forward to trying to get this into the ITF and then uh, going through that process and getting adoption and changing the world and making everything better. And we'll see how far we get on any of that. <laughs>